time, but we're going to get started. Okay, Val? Very good. All right. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Reynolds. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the United County History Center, and I welcome you to our virtual lecture series. This is Women's History Month, so we're happy to have um, Val from Fort Stanwix. Just as a matter of Zoom etiquette, please remember to mute your microphone. Also note this is being rebroadcast, so if you don't want to be seen, turn off your camera. We're going to open up things at the end for questions, and you can put them in the chat as well. I'm new to Zoom and learning things, so uh, bear with us as we get through this. Um, I should note, next Wednesday at 6.30, we're going to have an author named Paul Lockhart. He's actually going to broadcast from Canada, and he's going to be talking about his book, The Drill Master of Valley Forge, Baron Steuben and the Making of the American Army. Uh, here in Utica, we have a wonderful statue of him, and in northern Oneida County, um, his house is his later house is up there and um, a wonderful view of the valley. So that's next Wednesday. This morning in partnership with Fort Stanwix National Monument, we're hosting Valerie Morgan. She's talking about revolution, revelation, the importance of women in the fight for independence. Valerie began as a volunteer at Fort Stanwix in 1993 and has been at the park ever since continuing as a seasonal ranger and joining the ranks of the permanent staff. With her background in education, she is also an educational coordinator, works with teachers and students to help them understand the fort and the incredible stories at the site. From the beginning, Ranger Val has been intrigued by the accounts of the ladies of the revolution, many of whom are known only by their descendants. Through sharing their experiences, she hopes to bring a new perspective to the story of the American Revolution. So with that, I'm going to Pin Val here, and she can share her screen. Ooh. Let's see if I can get this to work. There's everybody. Val, can you share your screen? I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Beautiful. Whoops. Nope. Now I have to go through it because I apologize. Um, there we go. All right. Um, can everybody still see me? Because right now I can just see my face or a, my name. We got you. You're good. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you so much. Um, for having me today. Um, I too am new as a presenter to Zoom. Um, I've been on many Zoom calls before, but uh, as, um, as an audience member. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that everything goes the way it is in my head and that all of you will enjoy uh, what... I have to say about women in the revolution, especially in the Mohawk Valley. Um, when we think of the American Revolution, images of continental soldiers come to mind, battle-worn with tattered clothing, bare feet, and dirt-stained faces. These are the people who walked countless miles to face their enemies across a battlefield for the promise of freedom they may never see. Eventually, after an eight-year struggle, Independence from England was achieved, but did they do it alone? As you've probably surmised from the title of this program, added to what you already know about the American Revolution, the answer is no. Women played a major role in the war for independence. Names like Abigail Adams, the countless Molly Pitchers on the battlefields, and even perhaps Deborah Sampson may be familiar for their support of, support of and participation of the war. But this is central New York, so we're going to celebrate those women who played a part and made a difference in the American Revolution right in our own backyard. Hey, Val. And as an aside, 
Um, I'll be referring to Fort Stanwix as Fort Schuyler during the presentation as that was the American name for the fort during the War for Independence. Um, fort Stanwix is actually its British name used um, for the French and Indian War. So just so, um, <laughs> just so you realize um, that I haven't gone a bit loopy uh, during this, um, I will always say Fort Schuyler in reference to what we all know today as Fort Stanwix National Monument. Hey Val, there's a pen. Yes, yes. Turn your camera back on. We want to see your lovely face. Oh, it went away because yeah. I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. See if you can find it. Um, let, oh, here we go. Oh, that's interesting. It says, I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. We all love technology when it works, right? <laughs> Is that better? I can see myself now. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Val. Are we good? You're great. Wonderful. All right. Oh. Is that's interesting. It won't let me advance the slides. Do you have any advice or should I just go ahead? Uh, if you hit Alt tab, you should be able to get to your PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that. <laughs> Remember, I work in the 18th century, so <laughs> stuff like this scares me. Um, before we get into specifics, here's a little bit about the group we call Women of the Army. The image that you see here is one of my favorites. It's actually a modern image. Some of you may be familiar with the artist Don Triani. Um, he's very popular in the Civil War um uh realm but he has also begun doing extensive work for the american revolution but this image for me sums up the women's experience uh for a majority of the revolution um again barefoot her entire household on her back holding her young child's hand and off they go. Um, we often get these three questions. Who are they? Who were they? Well, um, there are some um, misconceptions on <laughs> who the ladies were um, during the revolution, those associating themselves with uh, the army. A majority of these ladies are wives of the soldiers. They're here following the army because they're from unsafe areas. You've got a majority of the New York line coming from New York City and the lower Hudson Valley area. It's occupied by the British very early on in the war. If you're leaning toward the side of independence, well, that's going to be unsafe. You've got the quartering acts saying the British can knock on your door and take over your residence. 
a lot of New York City is destroyed by a fire. These people have no place to go. And so you're forced, like this woman that you see, to pack up your entire life and go on a new journey. Um, the same goes for ladies throughout uh, the colonies or the brand new states um, at that point. Why were they? Why were they here? Well, as I said, they're refugees. So they're going to, if they don't have another family member to go with or another home in some cases of um, the wealthier families, that's why they're moving from place to place. Um, what were they? At the beginning of the war, they are a burden because the army doesn't even have enough resources for the soldiers, let alone all of these extraneous people who now need the resources of the army, food and shelter and um, perhaps a little bit of pay to assist with day-to-day um, -day, uh, needs that the army might not be able to um, provide. So eventually the army realized, wow, we've got a lot of soldiers deserting because they're worried about their wives and children back at home in these unsafe spots. So how are we going to retain the soldiers? Well, we're going to have to let women in. Initially, the thought was, we'll only let this amount of women in. That didn't work. So they said, fine, we'll let as many women as necessary in, but they need to earn their keep. So what are they doing? Well, they're doing laundry. Um, they're also serving as nurses. And some of them were actually cooked for the officers. So we've got these very mundane activities that are exceptionally necessary. Um, I was just talking about this with some folks the other day. Um, laundry, you, don't, you know, we think of laundry for our own families. And I know in the Morgan house, even four, <laughs> laundry for four um, tends to build up. You think of these regiments of two, three, four, five hundred people, that laundry, even though they're they're they may not be changing their clothes as often as we do today, they understand there's a correlation between unclean situations and disease. So they're hoping that. The more the laundry is done, the healthier the soldiers are going to be. And if we think about this, if the soldiers are busy doing laundry, they're not busy training as soldiers. Or in the case of Fort Schuyler, keeping up the fort from crumbling into the ground. Um, so these tasks start to become more and more important to how the army is functioning. Now the nurses aren't the Civil War nurses that we know of or the nurses that we know of today in our modern society. They are truly what um, a CNA would do is emptying the chamber pots, changing the bed linens, doing all of those, again, necessary tasks to ensure that the hospitals or the areas being used to treat sick and injured soldiers are clean or as clean as possible. So that's how the ladies are starting to earn their keep with the army itself. One question that I did not put up here, but we often get is how many that question, we do not have a proper answer to. 
Um, for example, there was supposed to be a count of the ladies at Fort Schuyler with the 3rd New York Regiment. We don't have that document yet. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Not necessarily. We're finding new things sometimes daily. So it could be in a drawer someplace in somebody's house. Um, there was a fire at the state archives in the 1930s. It could have been there. So it could have been documented, but it's lost to history through that fire. Um, or it may not have been done. We, we won't know um, until for some reason it lands in our lap. Um, hopefully it will at one point. Um, so our best guess is hundreds, if not thousands, throughout the course of the war um, of women following the army. So now that we have a good idea about the overall experience, let's get right down to who would have been here in the Mohawk Valley. The ladies of Fort Schuyler. So as we talked about before, the Continental Army regiments of New York were raised from New York City in the lower Hudson Valley area. So the overall story of these refugees coming from all of these big cities throughout all of the states or colonies applies to what's going on at Fort Schuyler as well. Val, um, Val yes. Patrick. So oh, oh, your camera's back. I got blurry. There Thank we you. go. Thank Absolutely. You. So again, not much is known about the ladies at Fort Schuyler. They're mentioned um, here and there. Uh, for example, Lieutenant Colonel Willett wrote in one of the orderly books, he had to scold the ladies for doing laundry on the parade ground, which is the big open area in the middle of the fort, instead of at the stream on the east side where they were supposed to have been doing the laundry. Um, he, he thought it very unmilitary like to, to have sloppy laundry <laughs> all over the middle of the fort. Um, also, we have an account of all of the ladies that had children um, being sent downriver to Fort Dayton, which is in modern day Herkimer, New York, uh, right before the, the British ride for the siege. So you see we have these groups, uh, the, the women as a whole being mentioned. However, uh, oh, also, we know where they were living. We've got that beautiful picture uh, right there of the tents in the ditch. Um, there were so many soldiers with the 3rd New York Regiment that there wasn't even enough space inside the fort to accommodate all of the soldiers, let alone having them displaced by these women and children. So they put housing, extra housing, in a space where they knew they would be safe, but not necessarily inside quarters um, within the fort walls. So they put up tents and they built huts uh, in the ditch uh, surrounding the fort. And this may seem horrific. <laughs> we get a lot of stunned looks um, from visitors who, who ask about the tents. Keep in mind, we're going to go back to what their experience would be at home. Would you rather be at home in a house occupied by somebody you consider to be an enemy or have your house destroyed and be homeless or have a tent or a hut in a secure place? So the, these are the living conditions of the women and children as they traveled around. Now, I wanna take this one step further as well. As they're walking from place to place, they may only have the umbrella of a tree <laughs> to protect them um, from perhaps a blanket of snow or uh, a rainstorm. Um, so this is, pretty decent as far as living conditions might go. Maybe not ideal, 
um, but the alternatives are far worse. We actually know about three women that I would love to share their stories. Um, these ladies <clears throat> were all at Fort Schuyler and um, reading about them, they, <laughs> they all have very interesting adjectives um, to describe them. So we have Nancy Weldon, and as you see, um, and some of the, you who may already know Mrs. Weldon's story are probably chuckling at the word sassy. Uh, Mrs. Moody, who is tenacious, and Mrs. McCarthy is miraculous. So let's get on with their stories. Um, Nancy Weldon is the wife of the Sergeant Major of the 3rd New York Regiment. Why do I have her as sassy? Well, she was court-martialed. Um, here are the circumstances. At the time that this incident occurred, her husband was at the, the military hospital in Albany. Technically, she actually should have been there with him. So if your husband had to go away, the wives were supposed to go with them. Something happened and she got into an argument with Sergeant Dean of the artillery detachment who was at Fort Schuyler as well. So here's the court martial record. He defrauded her of her rations. She defamed him of his character and they were both confined to quarters for that day. What does that mean in plain speak? Well, what we surmise is she went to get her rations for that day Sergeant Dean called her out on being there without her husband and draw, trying to draw rations. She gave him lip uh, for not, not minding his own business. And <laughs> the result of the court martial, they were put in time out until they could play nice with each other. <laughs> and really, this court martial um, uh, brief was literally that, just very brief. It said, who was involved and what their what happened and what their punishment was. It was no more than two or three lines. Um, I think it would be interesting to, to bear witness to actually what happened. Um, so she gets she gets the title of sassy. Now Mrs. Moody is actually the wife of one of the artillery captains who was at the fort in 1780 and 1781. And this story is interesting in that she and her 15 year old daughter were there with an officer. Typically officers' wives are not having to follow their husbands like those of the enlisted ranks. Um, you might have um, officers' wives either join their husbands briefly on a vacation. We know that Lieutenant Colonel Willett's second wife did that. She hated the fort and got out of there as quickly as she could. Um, or during winter encampments, you you have Mrs. Washington um, going to Valley Forge uh, to spend the winter with her husband, but they're put up in houses and they're still enjoying uh, the upper class life. Um, however, what we do know about the army overall in 1780 and 81 is a lot of the officers were poor at that point. They had started because they, in a lot of instances, were not taking pay, so their enlisted soldiers could have some. So they're whittling away at their fortunes, and you have um, them selling their homes and this and that. And the other thing, to be able to survive. So is that the case of the Moody's? Is that how Mrs. Moody um, came to survive at Fort Schuyler? Hopefully, as, as you'll hear me say a lot uh, during this presentation, we will get additional information on, and, on why they were there. 
So the final wife um, that I'd love to discuss is Mrs. McCarthy. She is an enlisted man's wife. Um, her husband's name was Dennis McCarthy. And we didn't even know this until 2012. Like I said, new information keeps coming at us and we love it. Um, it happened completely by surprise as one of our volunteers was looking over another soldier's pension deposition. Um, so you know how I talked about all the ladies with children were sent to Fort Dayton? Well, um, she could not make that journey um, on her condition of being very large with child. She was pregnant and they probably didn't want to send her on a 31 mile walk um, as she may have gone into labor and slowed things down. Or um, for those who have experienced um, trying to walk anywhere um, in the third trimester of pregnancy, you kind of get a little bit of uh, uh, slowed down. Um, so this is what we know about her, or we knew about her until 2012. And I'm going to read to you a quote from a journal that was kept uh, during the siege. A heavy and continual firing was kept up for near two hours, during which their cannon and mortars were playing on us very briskly, in which interim we had a man of the artillery wounded and a woman big with child wounded in the, in the thigh. The next day's entry being, the woman that was wounded with a shell last night was brought to bed in our southwest bomb proof of a daughter. She and the child are like to do well. So what we knew until 2012 was this unnamed woman who was large with child was hit in the thigh and she was forced to give birth the next day in the bomb proof or little um, storage area that was being used as a temporary hospital during the siege. From the uncovered pension deposition, however, the true extent of her wounds is discovered. And I'm gonna quote to you from that pension deposition. The effect of the explosion of a shell, which is a mortar, upon Mrs. McCarty, wife of one of my soldiers, taking out of her buttock a piece of flesh as large as a man's fist and her being safely delivered of a child the night after. Can you imagine that? A chunk of flesh the size of a man's fist, and I have pretty decent sized hands, um, taken out of her thigh. I'm 99% certain that's what put her into labor. Um, and having a wound that horrible and surviving it. And for those of you who have um, studied about childbirth in the 18th century, that could have killed her as well. They both survived. We would love to know what happened to Mrs. McCarthy and her daughter but that right now is lost to us as well. So hopefully, um, as I share this story often, uh, I say maybe one day her great, 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 great granddaughter will <laughs> come to the fort and say, hey, my relative was born here during the siege um, and we'll be able to ask all sorts of questions. Um, but until then, we'll go on what information we have. Absolutely miraculous. So, throughout the war, we have names like Mary Ludwig Hayes, Margaret Corbin. Those are the two of the many Molly pitchers who served on the battlefield um, on cannon crews, bringing uh, water to the cannon crews or sick um, or wounded soldiers. Um, and even secret soldiers like Deborah Sampson, who disguised herself and made it to the rank of a sergeant uh, disguised as Robert Sutliff or Shirtliff, um, actually participated in battles throughout the war. 
as far as we know, we don't have any sort of secret soldiers like uh, Deborah Sampson who served at Fort Schuyler um, during the siege. Uh, although Mrs. McCarthy and another unnamed woman can certainly take credit for battle wounds because one of the other ladies that stayed behind was hit in the face by a musket ball. However, Oriskany, uh, right here, um, eight miles away um, from where I'm sitting right now, um, is a different story. The Mohawk Valley War, though, um, that's that's what I'd love to highlight, is much more of a civil war in the true sense of the meaning of a civil war um, happened here instead of this general American revolution. Um, in fact, when we talk about Oriskany, um, everybody aside from a handful of Germans on that battlefield were from the Mohawk Valley. These were friends and family members and neighbors of one another, okay? So that's something to keep in mind when, when you're thinking about what happened at Oriskany. So how are women involved? Well, interestingly, both women who we know were involved at Oriskany are Native women, but they're on opposite sides. They're both from the Mohawk Valley, We've got Molly Brandt, who's a British allied Mohawk woman and sister to Joseph Brandt. She is credited with sending the messengers into the British camp saying, hey, the militia is um, stopped at Oriska and they're going to make the push to Fort Schuyler the next day. So in essence, she's the one who helped cause the battle, okay? So she's the loyalist um, story in this whole thing. Oppositely, we have uh, Two Kettles Together, who is an Oneida woman. Her husband is Han Yeri, and there's a completely different story in that case. So both are supporting their individual sides of the war. She is potentially one of the group of Oneida men and women who were present at the fort as the British arrived on August 2nd, 1777, and went through the British lines into the valley to let folks know that the British were here. Um, kind of like a female Paul Revere, right? The British are coming while well, the British are here. Um, and as the militia marched back up into uh, this area, into the Ariska area, she followed her husband. Um, she loaded pistols the night before and marched up and was getting ready to march to Fort Schuyler the next day. Well, they found themselves in the midst of a battle. Her husband, Han Yeri, was... Um, wounded in the wrist, and what she did to assist in the midst of the battle was to reload his weapon while he was firing. So he never had to worry about that and always had a loaded weapon. Um, so she actively participated in the battle itself. Um, she also accompanied her husband to Saratoga partially because he was still uh, recuperating um, from his wrist injury, but uh, she actually acted as a messenger throughout that battle as well. And we're actually going to revisit her in a little bit in our next section, but um, because of what she did at Oriskany and at Saratoga, she was rewarded for her service by Colonel Peter Gansbort uh, of Fort Schuyler on the behest of uh, General Horatio Gates with three gallons of rum for a winter supply for her family um, it, for the winter going from 1777 to 1778. And from what we've read, that was an extremely cold winter. So hopefully that that uh, reward kept them a little warm. Um, 
as they went through that horrible winter. So one of the other uh, ways that women were going to help is on the home front. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases in the Mohawk Valley, especially after the devastation of at Oriskany, um, there's a, a, a really incredible sign at Oriskany Battlefield that, that shares the devastation. It said, um, every household in the Mohawk Valley lost at least one man. And there were some households that lost every single male member. So that left a lot of these ladies to tend to the defense of their homestead on their own. So one story that I would love to share in, in this defense of their homestead comes from 1780. Um, it's Mrs. Shell. She's the wife of Christian, Christian Shell. Um, thankfully, he was still alive in 1780, all right? So he had survived the Battle of Oriskany, was home. But there were bands of loyalists and British allied natives going through the valley, still trying to wreak havoc on the homes of those who they considered to be their enemy. And there, a lot of these homes throughout the valley were fortified. So they were known as forts. Um, they were strengthened, they had loopholes in the walls, and, and that, that's how they um, rose to the classification of a fort. So don't think of it as a, a proper fort like Ticonderoga or for Fort Schuyler um, or Fort Dayton. Um, but uh, their story picks up in, in August of 1780, um, and their house was attacked by a band of loyalists and allied natives, about 80 of them. So um, Christian was fortunately in the house with his wife and three grown sons. Um, the, the men were firing through the loopholes, but some of the uh, attackers were finding any nook and cranny they could to get their weapons through. What did Mrs. Shell do? Well, she took an axe um, from beside the fireplace and started whacking the, the muskets as they were coming through the cracks in the walls and the loopholes. Um, and she bent the barrels so far that she rendered the weapons useless. So... Um, they were quite surprised at what was going on um, in that attack. And eventually, um, because of what was going on inside the house, um, the attackers went away. Um, again, I said we were going to go meet up with two kettles together again. Um, and her last documented service was actually August 14th, 1781, in another one of these um, fortified homesteads. Um, she was with a group of Oneida who were helping to defend these homes in the valley. And a group of 150 loyalists and British allied Indians at this time attack the homestead that they were at. Um, this would have been Fort Timmerman uh, near modern St. Johnsville. And they fought back and they defended the home and drove 150 folks on their way. Um, so these ladies had to, even though they weren't following the army, like the ladies of the army, or those who may have enlisted under an assumed name, played as much a role in the defense of their areas as those people did who were affiliated um, with the military itself. 
So that in effect brings us to the end of the war in 1781, the, the end of the major fighting as we get into um, the fall and what's going to happen at Yorktown. But I would love to share the story of a woman whose husband was in the 3rd New York Regiment, but she was never at Fort Schuyler. However, her story sums up how drastically the, um, the idea of having women affiliated with the army changed from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. And here she is, Sarah Osborne Benjamin. She lived to be at least 109 years old. She lived long enough to have her photograph taken. That's why I put up both of these, just because I, I think it's incredible to see these faces of the revolution, not as a painting or a sketch as you see, um, but with, with them right in front of us. Um, so she has a really interesting story. She actually received two pensions because two of her husbands uh, served in the American Revolution. And she has some great stories that she shared um, from people who were at the fort. So we're actually finding out more information about Fort Schuyler based on what she shared through her pension deposition, having not even been there. Um, so how does she play into all of this? Well, she ended up cooking for some of the officers and they've made their way to Virginia. They're at the surrender of Yorktown and um, she sees some officers throwing their hats into the air and yelling, huzzah. And she said, what's going on to those who are right next to her? And this quote is just incredible. Are you not soldier enough to know what it means? Was the, the, the question back from one of the officers. These women had come from being a burden to being such an important part of the army that they were considered to be soldiers themselves. So after she said no, he said, the enemy has just surrendered. So here she is witnessing this incredible moment in history and being considered just as important to what happened as those people who were wearing the, the regimental uniforms. Pretty amazing. So as we've come to the end of the American Revolution, um, I hope you've learned a little bit more about how these women helped by doing the laundry and serving as nurses and perhaps doing a little bit of cooking, help these soldiers win the war. Had they been forced to do all of these things themselves, they would have had less time to focus on the training and if you turn in, tune in on Wednesday to the uh, Steuben talk, um, you'll find out how with the training that the Baron provided or began for the Continental Army and the support of these ladies, we were willing to, or we were able to win our independence from England. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. Um, if you have any questions beyond uh, what we're able to discuss today, I've got my contact information up there. But right now, I'd love to open it up to any questions that you might have. 
And um, hopefully we'll see you in person at some point at Fort Stanwix National Monument. Thank you, Val. Excellent. <clears throat> I have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned that they have no idea of how many women were involved in this, in this area, in the New York Regiment, and they're mostly wives. So can't you like narrow it down and you must have a count of the, of the soldiers. Can you? We do. So um, you kind of get an idea about? Our, so I'll, I will go by what we generally say at Ford Stanwix, okay? okay. So at, at the time, the 3rd New York Regiment was there. Um, they had 530 some odd soldiers, okay? The soldiers are between, for the most part, the ages of 16 and 26. So some of them are married, some of them are not. We okay. don't know if some of these ladies did go to live with family members. Um, mm -hmm. We don't even know how many of them were married at that point. So out of 530 some odd, we think between a, like 100 and 200 may have been at the yep. fort. Yep, yep, that's but, about what Yeah, but who knows? It could have been um, 30, you know? <laughs> um, uh, that's why getting our hands on that return <laughs> mm -hmm. would be a little piece of heaven. Mm hmm. I, the other thing is, you said some of them were not married. Could you imagine being a woman in that era, young, 20, whatever, going off and on their own to do that? That was unthought of, unheard of. Yes. You know? Absolutely. You know? They were to stay home and do, you know, learn to be a wife. And it was just interesting, you know? Yeah. And, and conversely, after, like, after a risk any, having to figure out what to do. Right. Um, because your husband and your sons have been killed or so horrifically injured mm -hmm. that they can't keep up the homestead. Right, right. Yeah, it's just the whole thing is interesting. I, you know, living in the area and, you know, just... Sometimes people don't take advantage of what we have in this area and they have no idea of what is involved in the Mohawk Valley, Steuben, Ariskany, the whole sure. thing. Sure. Sure. But I'm Absolutely. the type of person that drags my children through every historical place. <laughs> we do the same. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Florida, but we're stopping Philadelphia. Sure. We're stopping all over. <laughs> Val, it's we got a, a question. Stretch, right? We got a yeah. question from the chat. Were the women compensated for doing laundry? Um, they were given food and shelter, um, and a little bit of pay. But keep in mind that they had a hard time paying the soldiers. So if they were having a hard time paying the soldiers, the women were very happy with food and a place to sleep. So you, met, you mentioned Fort Dayton. That's Herkimer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Modern day Herkimer. And if you're traveling uh, on the thruway, um, I guess as you get closer to the Herkimer exit, there's a little blockhouse hmm. um, that you can see from the Herkimer exit. Uh, that's roughly where Fort Dayton would have been. Mm hmm. So it was outside of the village, or outside of, outside of Herkimer then? Hmm. There's still, there's also some speculation that it could be, from what I remember, um, it could be under the McDonald's in Herkimer too. <laughs> <clears throat> hmm. Very interesting. Any more questions from anyone? Looks like we're good. Valerie, mm -hmm. thank oh, you so okay. much. Uh, it's an inc incredible amount of stories and you're a wonderful storyteller. So we appreciate mm -hmm. you being with us today. Thank you for having me. All right. Yeah.
Thank you. All right, please come see me at the fort. Yep. <laughs> we will. When are you opening up? Um, so we are opening up three days a week on April 20th. Um, the best way to get the most up-to-date information is um, either through um, our Facebook page or our website because we're going to kind of roll out um, our, uh, our open hours uh, throughout the summer based on staffing and what what regulations we have to follow right now. Sure. But um, the first day we will be open and it's fort only um, through most of the year. So the, the visitor center, the Willett Center will not be open uh, for the summer. Uh, we're trying to keep everybody still outside. So just a reminder for everyone, um, we're, we're gonna, uh, this has been recorded. We're gonna put it up on YouTube probably in a few days. If you want to share it with others, it will be available for a long time. And a reminder that on Wednesday, we have the Drillmaster of Valley Forge. Author's going to be speaking about an incredible book about a very important person from our county. So again, thank you, Val. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for coming to see me today. Excellent. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.